Joanna, welcome to the show. Now, is feminism poisoning women? I think poisoning is perhaps a little bit of a strong way of putting it. Oh, you've got a book called Women Against Feminism. Women versus Feminism. Okay. I certainly don't think feminism is doing women any favours at all. Mm. Uh, I think feminism's pitched against men and it presents women and men as having opposing interests, which I think is very, very problematic. But I think the thing that disturbs me most about feminism and the reason why I wrote the book is because it presents women as being victims in society today. It tells the world, um, it tells women that that the world is against them, that they're going to be paid less than men, that they're going to have this really terrible time. Well, they are paid less than men. They're going to pay you. Come on. Well, you actually look into the statistics of that. You look at men and women who are doing the same job at the same level for the same number of hours each week, and actually it would be completely illegal to pay women less than men. Mm -hmm. um, so, yes, there is a gap overall, but that's when you talk about averages. So it, it ignores the fact that, on average, women tend to work fewer hours hours a week than men. Women and men choose different careers to go into uh, right from the outset. And, and there are all kinds of differences that are just overlooked when we start talking about average figures. Mm. But this narrative that women are paid less than men, that the workplace is a really horrible place, you're going to be sexually harassed, um, that even just walking down the street, all this terrible insults and sexism is going to be approach, uh, encroaching upon you. I think it gives women a really um, unfair sense of what it's like out there in the world today. And uh, my fear, so my daughter's 13 now, my real fear is that for a, a girl growing up like that today who's really got so many opportunities in front of her, feminism actually puts women off going out there into the world and uh, you know doing whatever it is they want to do. So you sound like Jordan Peterson <laughs> with one key difference. You're a woman. <laughs> well, so, sorry, I know I can't assume your, your gender. <laughs> we live in those kind of those times. But did that make you a sort of betrayer of the sisterhood? How did this go down? amongst the feminist community? So I would say it went down quite badly yeah. <laughs> among the feminist community. And the thing that really surprised me, I think, I knew obviously when I was writing the book, I knew it would be explosive, I knew it would be controversial. But the thing that um, surprised me is how controversial it is among the woman, women who are doing best, if you like, in society at the moment, the women who get the platforms on national television, the women who write the columns in national newspapers, women who have extremely large salaries who work for the BBC and it's almost as if their fear is that I'm going to take their victimhood away from them. Don't tell the world that we're equal to men. Don't tell the world that actually everything's great being a woman. I want my victimhood. Don't take it away from me. And I was really surprised to hear that expressed so starkly. So are you intimating that feminism isn't about equality, it's about wanting more power? I think uh, one thing, and I think this is important in a number of debates nowadays, I think feminism has become an exclusively middle class preoccupation. So you look at these surveys uh, that are carried out from time to time where they ask women, how, do you identify yourself as a feminist? And it's always surprising how few women mm. respond that they do. Um, so in some surveys, it's as little as like 7%. Yeah. At most, I think it goes up to about 30% of but women. I, hang on a minute, I, I thought in this place behind us over here in Westminster, it's compulsory. Exactly, exactly. It's almost like you're, you're a traitor if you're not. And I think certainly in institutions like the BBC, The Guardian, a lot of academia, you know, to be a woman and particularly, like I say, to be a middle class woman and say you're not a feminist gets you ostracised. Mm. I mean, that completely throws you out of polite society. <laughs> middle class women are supposed to be feminists and are not supposed to challenge that narrative. But then it becomes very uh, quickly reveals the fact that this is about protecting their own interests. This is about CEOs and presenters at the BBC arguing for more money for them, mm. uh, not necessarily what's going to be in the best interests of everyone in society. But surely I could say to you, well, you know, cry me a river. Men rule the world. Men hold all the power. Surely it's about time women had some back. I mean, you must have heard that debate. Absolutely, absolutely. I don't think it's true. I mean, if we were sat here 30, 40 years ago, yeah, definitely you would point to men who were in the position of power in every leading institution in society. You go over there to the Houses of Parliament. Again, you go to the BBC. You mix in the circles that the political class move in nowadays. And actually, what again, another thing that's really surprised me over the past couple of years is how few men... <laughs> 
<laughs> are in these positions of power. Women only shortlist, so exactly. are, are now in the, the, the Labour Party. Exactly. I, and incidentally, you know, in, um, and we might come on to talk about Brexit mm. and can democratic reforms I, I think we we'd like <laughs> to see implemented. I would like to see all women shortlists abolished completely. I concur. They're madness. <laughs> they're sexist. Well, they are sexist. They are sexist. They are sexist. They are sexist. But I think far more fundamentally, they're anti-democratic. Mm. I think nobody should be able to choose who want, who they want to represent them in Parliament other than the constituents mm. of that particular area. It should be for the people who live in an area to decide who it is who they want to send to Parliament, whereas what you've got with the Labour Party is actually imposing mm. lists on people. They've decided in Westminster, they've decided we want more women MPs, so therefore you, in this particular town, in the northeast of England or wherever it happens to be, you must have these five women to choose from and it doesn't matter what you think who you want to represent you so yeah it's sexist but also it's really anti-democratic uh, it's also really unhelpful for women because it's saying you're not uh, the best you can't, for the job exactly it's saying you can't woman. get there you can't do this unless we make an all-women shortlist which is really insulting now one of the things you you write about in women versus feminism is a, a, a topic dear to my heart um, you know before I got into politics I was campaigning on boys in education and I just think you know we, we have betrayed an entire generation because let's face it there are endless initiatives to, to help young girls young women and that's all great you know we want that but is there a sense that the boys and in particular the white working class boys have just been left at the bottom to stew I think this is absolutely true and I think it's utterly tragic. Uh, there were new statistics just out this week uh, yeah. focusing on the primary school yeah. um, age group and again just showing how young uh, that gap emerges and how it then stays. It doesn't just mm. disappear once once they get to school. I mean you could say arguably um, that boys develop a bit later than girls. Uh, boys need a bit more time to go out and run around in the playground well, rather than being forced you're, to sit still. You're assuming a, a physiological or psychological <laughs> difference. <laughs> And, and that, that, that's the, the enemy of, 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 of the feminist doctrine. I mean, we're all equal, surely. But back to the education thing, it said that the boys are now 10% behind, and it was 7% a few years ago. So the, the, the gender gap is widening, but we don't hear much about this, do we? Why okay. is this, why are we unable to focus on the genuine needs of these um, demographics. Mm -hmm. Why is it swept into the car? Well, I think that's a really great question, and I, I blame feminism for it, not just in the sense of feminist teachers um, wanting to champion the interests of the girls that they teach, but more to the point that the way feminism presents the world to us is this kind of zero-sum game, mm. that if you um, make some victories for girls, then the boys are going to suffer. As if we can't just say, actually, do you know what? All the pupils we teach are equally mm -hmm. deserving of our attention and we need to if there's a gender gap we need to work out and make sure ways find ways to make bring the boys up and make sure that we're meeting the educational needs of working class boys I think one of the problems is this perception that if you do that, girls are somehow going to suffer. Mm. Now, I don't see the logic of that. I don't see how it has to be either or. I think mm. we can not beyond the wit of teachers to devise ways to bring about educational success in all the pupils they teach. Do you think modern universities are hostile towards men? I think there's a really huge gender gap on campus, particularly in, well, most obviously in terms of numbers. Uh, I think the latest figures are about 55% of young women go to university compared to 45% of young men. And the problem is when you get to university, there is this really dominant narrative, and it's a phrase I completely abhor, of toxic masculinity. Mm. And that's the only real sense in which men, young men, young male students seem to be discussed on campus that they're perpetrators of rape culture, that they need to be corralled into consent classes, that they're told not to rape their classmates, um, that they're seen essentially as a problem. You know, they're going to join the rugby team and get drunk. They're going to be uh, loud and misbehaving in class. And I think if I was a young man going to university and that's what you're bombarded with from week one, mm. you are going to very quickly draw the conclusion, this is not a suitable place for me. This is not a welcoming environment. Maybe that's why they're staying away. 
I, I mean, why would you go to a club where you're not welcome? I think that's absolutely true. And mm -hmm. I think the problem is, though, that uh, this is perhaps done in the best interests of women. I'm not quite convinced, but maybe this is why it's being done. They think they're protecting women by pushing this narrative. But as we've been talking about, women, when they leave university and go out into the workplace, they're going to work alongside men as male colleagues. So if you're telling women at university that men are toxic, you're not exactly setting them, so, setting them up well mm. for life post-university. Is free speech on campus in grave peril? I think it is, and I think it is for a number of reasons. We've got the uh, idea nowadays, of, which I find utterly bizarre, this idea that free speech is a right-wing mm -hmm. value, yeah. um, that if you argue for free speech, that automatically makes you right-wing. Now, I'm a, a real champion of free speech. I've never, ever considered myself to be right-wing. Other people have labelled me that way, but I don't consider well, myself to be right-wing. You, you were labelled a transphobe. You, you were banned from campus, weren't you? Well, they, they attempted tempted to get me banned from campus when I went to, I, I was asked to do a talk at King's College in London, incidentally, on a topic which had nothing whatsoever to do with gender, I was supposed to be talking, I mean, this is the irony that's completely lost on these people, the talk I was supposed to be doing was on academic freedom, mm. <laughs> nothing to do with feminism, nothing to do with gender, nothing to do with transgender, but you get these, and I think, well, I know Toby Young's used this label, but I don't think he coined it, um, this idea of offence archaeologists yeah, yeah. who will dig into everything you've ever said and everything you've ever written, mm -hmm. find a couple of sentences that can be taken out of context and use that to set alarm bells ringing and say to people that you believe in something which is really distorted. Okay. But then you have this view um, that's so common on campus, and again, I think it's a very disturbing view, that words are the equivalent of violence, um, that if I, if I say something um, that might upset someone, that could either lead quite directly to people instigating physical attacks or the words itself are enough to cause a kind of physical harm do, do to people. Th do you think if, if human beings from 50 years ago came to Britain now and heard what you're saying, they'd go, this country has lost its mind? <sighs> I hope so. I think they would. I think they absolutely would. And in a way, you know, it's kind of a sign of how privileged people are and on what an amazingly privileged lifestyle. If you're going to say that words are violence, well, you've never lived in a war zone. You've never experienced a physical attack because if you had experienced a physical attack, if you had lived in a war zone, then you certainly wouldn't mm. be sitting there saying, oh, my God, the words you're using are so violent and so aggressive. But if words are violence, the intent is to silence, right? That's what it's all about. Absolutely. And the irony is, as soon as you make that supposition that words are violence, it then justifies actual physical violence, mm. as we've seen, particularly on American campuses, in shutting people down. It gives them the moral high ground. They, they assume they've got this sense of moral authority. So we've seen in this country in, in recent um, months in the run-up to the EU elections, for example, mm. uh, this trend for milkshaking yeah. people, um, which is really horrible, you know, and, and it, it's a way of very rapidly and physically shutting down debate but rather than being outraged you see a lot of commentators applauding these people celebrating this. I, I think that's a key point because this this sense of dehumanizing and putting people into this box you know you're a Nazi you're, you're a fascist it allows this kind of verbal and physical violence, doesn't it? It does, and I, I think one, you know, I'm moving away a little bit now from feminism and education and stuff, but I think one of the big political problems we've got in society today is the overinflation reuse of language, mm. where people are just called quite randomly, you know, anybody who expresses any view that be as even slightly away from the kind of political class norm is labelled a fascist yeah. and Nazi. And I mean, you see a very good example with the prorogation of parliament and how this has been labelled a coup. Yeah. Well, you know, you go to South Sudan seriously and try and tell somebody in Sudan that um, the British Parliament, Britain, is currently in the grip of a coup. They would imagine tanks on the streets. Yeah. They would imagine military personnel um, stationed on street and, corners. And the thing about it, it's also infantile. I mean, one minute they were saying, this is the coup. So Boris Johnson <laughs> said, OK, let's have a general election. Exactly. Um, where, where's the coup in that? <laughs> it's infantile. But election. It, it's infantile, but it's also dangerous because then you know, heaven forbid, but just say there were tanks on the street. 
where do you go? You've used up the language. Mm. You've used up the words of a coup to describe Parliament being shut down for three extra days yeah. compared to what it's like normally. So you've got no language left to describe this. Again, heaven forbid, but just say we really do have an attempt at fascism in this country. And, you know, we've used up the word mm. fascism. We've relativised and trivialised these words. You haven't got the language left to mm. describe then when terrible things really do happen. So do you think we've we've crossed the bridge, particularly at universities now, from education towards indoctrination? I think it is still possible to get a good university education, um, but I think it's becoming increasingly difficult. I think there are a number of things going on. Um, one is that there is a group think. Um, I mm. think when you've got such a large majority of academics and people who work in university sharing the same opinion, they come to see it as being bizarrely not even a political mm. opinion. They come to see it as just common sense. It's just how everybody sees the world. So then you come along and challenge that and you really stand out you seem like the extremist so you spend a lot of time on campuses you know you're an education expert what would you say is the percentile you know, of Remainers and mm. Leavers in, in that world? Well, we don't even need to guess because the Times Higher Education did run a poll of academics and other people on campus uh, prior to the 2016 referendum and the figure came out at about 90%. 90% Remain? 9-0 Remain. I think maybe you're just under like 88, 89. Wow. Um, and there's kind of problems with this poll, you know, they were self-selecting the people who answered it. But certainly my experience on campus, uh, talking to a lot of people who work within universities, it doesn't seem that far off to me. So, so, so here's the point. If 90% of lecturers are teaching the next generation of potential yeah. policy makers that Remain is, is the new you know, ideology, mm -hmm. where, where are we going to go with this? Well, I think it's very worrying. It's very, very worrying because it closes down the train for, for critical thought. You know, you, like I say, if you come onto campus as somebody who wants to um, not even kind of celebrate Brexit, but somebody who wants to even just question the EU or question the status quo, you stand out. Um, your views are presented as being different to the norm. Um, and Again, to come back to what you were saying about working class boys who might want to go to university mm. and kind of have this label of toxic masculinity attached to them. If you go to a university open day in like you're interested in studying sociology or politics, mm. for example, you go to the open day, you hear the lecturer give a spiel about why you should come to this university. And even if they're not talking directly about Brexit, but they turn to their colleagues and they're making jokes about Brexiteers. Mm. Um, they're laughing about people who voted Brexit. You, again, very, very quickly pick up the message this is not the university for me. This place is not a welcoming environment for somebody who maybe doesn't even think like me, but members of my family voted to leave. And they're laughing at the views of members of my family. The other message it sends out is, well, if I think if I think Brexit is the right thing to do, I better keep quiet. Mm. I don't want to be laughed at in that way, so I better shut up. I find that, that, that terrifying, this sort of tyranny of the majority means that the rest of us either just keep quiet or we adopt and blend in. Absolutely. And obviously, this is not just academia. You know, we're sat here opposite uh, the Houses of Parliament. We've talked about the media. But the problem is, you know, we have to remember, I have to remember, I have to remind myself that they're not the majority. You know, the majority mm. of people in this country did actually vote to leave the yeah. EU. And there's no evidence to suggest that there's been this widespread changing of people's minds. Um, but they are the majority in the political, media, education, establishment so it's easy to think that they are the majority of kind of polite society if you like. Okay to sort of conclude how worried do you think we should be about this indoctrination process in universities in terms of moving forward to policy and what can we do about it? Yeah I think I think we should be worried well I don't know I think that's a really good question and I, I have to confess I don't really know what I think. I meet some great young people when I'm on campus um, people who are prepared to say that despite all the views of the lecturers 
they're going to start a free speech society or they're going to have a debate and invite five Brexiteers along. Mm. And there are some amazing young people who are really at the forefront of, of sparking off interesting and exciting things in universities. So I would not want to be too pessimistic. Good. But you look at the ideas that they're taught in the classroom and the fact is it is that much harder for them. You yeah. know, and I don't think it's impossible we can change things, but I do think we should be concerned about this. And I, I think we should champion the rebellious spirit of Brexit and Brexiteers, the anti-establishmentism, you know, the anti-authoritarianism, the anti-tyranny of it all, and just keep young people talking about all of this and make them proud of who they are. Definitely, definitely. And I think that's a really important thing. Um, you know, the, these young people who are pro-Brexit, wanting to have free speech societies, they are the anti-establishment figures. They're the rebels. And I think yeah. what's so horrible, we've talked about language a little bit, you know, you've got the kind of Remainer elite in Parliament trying to present themselves as being kind of rebels and anti-establishment figures. What utter rubbish, you know, they have every authority figure on their side. You know, they are not rebels. They are wanting to keep us fixed to the status quo. Wow. You know, the real rebels are the people arguing to, for change, wanting to turn upside down the world as we know it and wanting to bring about Brexit. Well, Joanna Williams, it's been inspiring. Thank you very much. Wow, well, you've, got a, you've got us all <laughs> thinking there are a few hand grenades in the bunker. That's the point of All Opinions Welcome. So guys, it's been a fabulous show. Hope you enjoyed it. Now, please join in the conversation online, comment, share, get stuck in. This is your show, over to you.